Amen. Amen. All right, go ahead and get your Bible out tonight and just remain seated. And go ahead and turn to Job chapter 1 and verse number 6. That's where we'll begin. Job chapter 1 and verse number 6. Now, the last time we were in the book of Job, we covered the introduction to the book of Job, and then we covered the first five verses. And we looked at uh, Job's character. We saw what kind of man he is, his character. Tonight, verses 6 through 19, we will cover, Lord willing, we're going to look at Job's calamity. And then we'll finish tonight by looking at verses 20 through 22, and we're going to see Job's consecration. So we, in this chapter, we see his character, his calamity, and then we see his consecration. And we're going to begin at verse number 6 tonight. So before we begin, I want us to bow our head and close our eyes, and I would like Brother Donnie Pillar to pray for this Bible study and preaching, because it usually it'll start out as a Bible study, it'll start out as teaching, and somehow or another I'll get to preaching, but whatever it turns into, <laughs> Brother Donnie, would you pray for me and pray for the people here tonight? Fathers, we come to you tonight, we're so thankful that we have the Word of God in our hands. Yes, we do. I'm thankful that Brother yeah. Dennis has taken the time to study, to teach. We pray for him tonight that you give him the words to teach verse by verse. Yes. The oldest book in the Bible. Yes. We thank you, God, that we have the truth. We're so thankful that we can sit here mm. and that, that, we, that we can hear and see that, that the Holy Spirit of God moved upon men to teach. Yes. And we're so thankful this church is a lighthouse in this community that the, that the truth is being preached. Mm. Father, we pray for the people in this church. We pray for each teacher pray for each one and whatever job that they have yes, that you just bless them and now father we pray that you just be with the remainder of the service and we pray for the teaching yes we yes. ask you yep. to enlighten our hearts tonight yes, and we have open mind open heart to receive the word of god mm. we ask this in jesus name amen 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 Verse number six, now there was a day. <laughs> yes, there was. And then verse number 13, it says there was a day. In verse number six, the devil is showing up. And then in verse number 13, the devil is showing out. And I don't believe it's any coincidence that six, the number of man, and 13, the number of rebellion, when it talks about there is a day. And I want you to listen to me. The Bible makes it very clear that you and I do not know what a day may bring forth. Proverbs 27.1 says that. It says, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. And so I want you to notice that there's a day there. And unfortunately, all of us have had that, haven't we? There was a day when this happened. There was a day when I got that phone call. There was a day when the test results came back. There was a day when I got the bad news. We've all been there. And the thing about it is, you, you, you and I have no idea when that day is going to come. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't come announced. You're, you're not warned. It just shows up. And always remember this, just like that day that happened in verse number 13. Before that was a day up in heaven. So there's something going on up in heaven that always what is happening down here on the earth is a result of it. Whatever it is, we may not understand it. But before it ever happens down here on the earth, the one that's in control of the earth up in heaven, he knows what's happening. He knows what he's going to allow or not allow and how he's going to work the thing out. But the Bible says there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. 
So Satan and the sons of God come and present themselves before the Lord. What pride. But he is, and this is what he does. The Bible says he's the accuser of our brethren, Revelation chapter 12, verse number 10. The Bible says that the devil in 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 is the God, little g, of this world. And so he's a prideful individual. He's, he would fail because of his pride. And so he comes and he comes, the Bible says, to, to present himself before God with the sons of God. Now the sons of God, and if you can look at a reference over there in the book of Job, chapter 38, verse number 7. And you can see that the sons of God were a pre-Adamic beings. And they're spiritual beings. And they're fallen beings now. And when you read about them, you can read about If you want to turn there, you can turn there and read this with me. Or you can listen to me very intently. But I want to read to you about where you first pick up about the sons of God. And that's in Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Genesis 6, 1 through 4. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the, the daughters of men, that they were fair, and that they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said... My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he is also, he also is flesh, yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth, giants now, if that stuff is true in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old men of renown. Now, I've talked to you about this before, but these men came down and cohabitated with the women. And there's evidence that with beasts and these spiritual angelic type beings, whatever, however you want to call them, um, when they do that, they had an offspring, the Bible says, and that's where we got the giants. And there's still evidence of people finding bones and Evidence, and I'm not going to go into it because a lot of it is, is some wild stuff, but I believe some of the literature, some of the, the documentaries and the stuff, I believe it's very true where they have located their giants still on the earth in different secluded places today. And then you have to look at all this UFO stuff. Listen, UFOs, again, I do not believe are little tiny Martians flying around, okay? But what I do believe UFOs is when you go back to where these angelic beings left their first estate, and they go down there and they cohabitate with women and with beasts. And they make another line of, 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 of people, of beings. And these things have the power that, uh, that, a, that a, a special powers that an angel would have. But they're not fully angel. They're not fully a spiritual being. They're part of a physical being. And that's why they would be limited. An angel would not need a spaceship. But a half angel, half beast or half man or giant or whatever would we have all these ufos and these satyrs you'd read about where's up what's a, what's a which one is it? it's a satyr the one with a with a the man with the head and then a, a body of a horse or and we read about that mythology and we say oh none of that's true and that's no no there's a lot of that stuff that that we get that i believe is actually absolutely truthful and then you watch all this Star Wars stuff. If you watch it, this, this Darth Vader, he's half man, half machine, and, and all that kind of stuff. Listen, man, there's some, <laughs> there some crazy things that's went on in this world. And, and, and you think if Hollywood dreams it up, it can't be true. But who do you think inspires some of that stuff? The devil. Now, the Bible says in Jude, verse number 6, And the angels which kept not their first estate... But left their own habitation, he hath reserved an everlasting change under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. So I, I don't know what all has happened and what all that means or whatever. But I do believe that there was a race. And people say, well, you know, well, how did they get through the flood? Uh, but, they, 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 but they show up. They did. And on the other side of the flood, I believe. And... You know, people say, well, these, do these things come from in the earth or they're out there on another planet or all that kind of stuff? You know, I don't have the answer to all that stuff. But I know this. I know that the sons of God were spiritual beings that come down and had physical relationship with human beings. And it, they produced an offspring. <laughs> so we'll go on from there. 
That's what the sons of God are, okay? All this other stuff you read and, and some of these other reference Bibles and all, and I'm not going to get into that tonight. It, they, that's, I've told you exactly from the Bible what the Bible says, what they are. And just because you have trouble believing it doesn't mean I'm going to try to teach something else. All right, verse number 7. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Now the Lord knew where he came from, but a lot of times the Lord asks questions like that. Um, maybe to get some, something implied. And it is implied in this verse that, say, that the devil can um, just go just about anywhere. He can go to Jupiter, Mars, a, a galaxy far, far away. Now Satan answers to and fro in the earth. Notice what he says. He said, whence cometh thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, uh, from going to and fro in the earth. That's not necessarily in the earth. He's just, uh, he's just uh, covering the earth. From walking up and down in it. I don't know that that necessarily means he's in it, but he absolutely could be in it. Uh, there's a book that came out years ago, and I read it. How many of you have ever read a book or saw any type of thing, uh, movie, or anything entitled by the title Journey to the Center of the Earth? Okay, several of you, good, where they believe there's, whole, there's uh, deep holes in the uh, poles, maybe the north and the south poles, and, and the people have claimed that they actually got in there and went in there. There's a whole civilization down there in the middle of the earth. And you say, oh, man, that's just Hollywood. That's just far-fetched. I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so. I mean, right down there in the heart of the earth, in the, in the, right in the middle of the earth, is hell. But there could be something else down in there, too. So, so I believe the devil and maybe those things that go in the earth and out of the earth and on top of the earth. And I'll be glad one day when they leave the earth. <laughs> And he said, I'm going to and fro. And that matches 1 Peter 5, 8. It says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil. Notice what it says about the devil. As a roaring lion walketh about seeking, listen, seeking whom he may devour. That's what the devil's doing. He's just walking and prowling, man. He's walking and prowling. And you need to understand that. That's his job. Verse number 8. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? <laughs> there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, on the one that feareth God and escheweth evil. Now I want you to notice something very important here tonight. God issues the challenge. Do you understand that? God issues the challenge. God brings this up. God gets the thing going. And it's hard for us to understand that stuff sometimes. And that's why it's so important. You know, Dr. Ruttman said something one time that's always stuck with me. He says, sometimes the devil and the Lord work so closely together and they're, and they're so similar because they're spiritual beings that sometimes it's very hard to tell who's doing what. Is it the Lord or the devil? And the longer I've lived, the more I've found out that to be the truth. And you can find that out by reading the book of Job. They, they didn't have any idea what was going on down on the earth. And they had no idea. Job and his friends and everybody else had no idea that there was something going on. And the devil and the Lord were working together. You say, ah, oh, don't say it like that. Yes, I'll say it like that. But God issued the challenge and God made the stipulations and the boundaries as to what the devil could and could not do to Job. So that's exactly how it was happening. And boy, you and I had better figure that out in our life. How the devil's going to deal with us and what God's doing. They both work in a supernatural way. Now notice that God calls Job his servant. And this is God's testimony of Job. This is not what another fellow says about you. This is what God said. He says there's nobody on the earth like Job. Job's during the time of the book of Genesis. That's how far back he lived. And he says at this time when he's on the earth, there's nobody that fears me, me like he does. He's a perfect man. That means he's mature. Um, he's, uh, he's complete. He's as a righteous man, and he avoids evil. The Bible says there in that verse that he escheweth evil. There's none like him in the earth. So he's, he's saying, look, you need to try my man Job. There's nobody else like him. And again... God says, I'm going to pit my greatest human against the most wicked, darkest power. And God had a right to do it, and he did it. And then, verse number 9, Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for naught? Now, here we go. 
He said, does Job fear you for no reason? <laughs> does he fear you just because you're God and he loves you and he's wanting to be faithful? And notice what he brings up. And here's the accusation. Remember now, he is an accuser. That's what the devil does. He's good at it. He is an accuser. Verse number 10. He says, has, thou not, not, has not thou made an hedge about him and about his house? And about all that he hath on every side. Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in thy land. You know what the devil is saying? He's saying, look, you protected Job. You made Job rich. You've given him everything. And that is why he's serving you. Now listen. And listen carefully. What the devil said about Job was wrong. But it's right about many people. Do you hear me? The devil wasn't crazy just thinking this thing up. He knows humans even way back then. That's that, this health, wealth, and prosperity gospel that we have nowadays. If you come and sign up and get on God's team, whatever that means, they don't hardly ever give a plain plan of salvation. Then you sign up for God, and this is what you sign up for, to be healthy, to be wealthy, to be prosperous, and have everything, and not to be sick, and everything to be fine, and everything to turn out all right, and no problems. That is so foreign to New Testament Christianity. But a fellow that used to be a pit boss in Vegas said this one time, if you're going to con other people in order to con someone else, they have to have a little con in them. And I used to have more pity on some of these poor, uh, stupid Christians. I'm just going to go ahead and say it. Than I do now. And I'm going to tell you why. I have learned over the years that after a while, you can't keep up um, deceiving people with that nonsense unless they want to be deceived. They want something for nothing. They want the, they're not willing to sign up for the persecution of Jesus Christ for the ways of the cross Amen. being strong in the Lord they only want to sign up for all the good they can get well you're no better than a lost person when you're like that so what he said about Job was not right and we find that out but it's, that's, it's right about a lot of people he said you he said you made a hedge about him about his house you've taken care of him that's why he serves you and notice what he says. He says, but put forth thine hand now, verse number 11, and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. Do you know what accusation he makes? He's saying, you just, I tell you what, God, you take away all those blessings that you've given him, and your man Job that you think is so great, he will curse you to your face. And what did God do in return? Verse number 12. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. Do you know what the Lord does? Listen to me now. This is the righteous, holy, loving God. He gives Satan permission to do anything that he wants to do. To Job and his life, except at this point, he cannot put his hands on Job. Remember, I also want you to remember this tonight. The Lord initiates this showdown. And then the Lord makes the rules. It is the Lord that allows Job to suffer. Well, you've got to get a hold of that tonight. Now, does God ever make mistakes does he ever do wrong? Do you know uh, Brother Bisco was talking about atheists, and he made a great point about people that turn out to be atheists and Gnostics in Sunday school this morning, talking about when he talks about them, many of them have a church background, and they do. That's absolutely true. I've dealt with them. And, uh, and when you deal with Gnostics and atheists and some of these folks like he was talking about, the big people, the big philosophers and all, Many times they'll pick on the Bible about a supposed inaccuracy or a supposed contradiction. That happens every once in a while. But you know what they do most of the time? Most of the time, 
what they are looking for in the Bible. These same people that says this is a fairy tale. Well, well these same people that are Gnostics and atheists uh, say, well, this they'll at least take it for true because this is what they'll say. They'll say, you mean to me to tell me there is a God, a God that's so cruel as him to do, has to do that and give you the verse, won't they? You mean to tell me there's a God that would do this to women and children and a God that would do this? And you mean to tell me a God that would put people in hell forever? And that's, and that's where many people, many people, they don't fall out with the Bible and church and God based on, on a, I just don't know if that's really true or not. I don't know if that's historically accurate. They fall out with God because they read about a God doing things they don't agree with. Amen. And so they leave. And become self-professed atheists or an agnostic. Or just say, well, I don't, I don't believe you can know there's a God, agnosticism. Or they will say, if there is a God, who wants to serve him? But all they do is they look at God's decisions, but they never look at their own heart. And so what you've got to do is you've got to read enough of the Bible and understand enough of the Bible and about the character of and the authority of God and what it teaches you in this book about God to understand when I get to those places I read about and as a human I don't quite understand why he reacts this way that I have been given enough truth and I have seen him do enough in my heart and in my life and others that I by faith just trust him in those areas that I don't understand and realize that the problem is never with God. It's my finite understanding and my wicked heart trying to figure out a perfect God. Amen. That's why atheist, being an atheist is not an intellectual problem. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. But you better come to terms with it. You don't sign up to become a Christian so everything can be great. You tell that to all those folks you read about in the book of Mar in the Fox's Book of Martyrs. You tell that all to the first century Christians. You tell that to the ones that were thrown to the lions, had their babies snatched out of their arms and fed to the pigs, watched their husbands burn to death or drown. You tell them that. We are so far away from New Testament Christianity today. It's absolutely amazing what people think. Just me and Jesus. You don't know nothing about you and Jesus. The average Christian don't. All you know is you live in a country where everybody's fat and taken care of. And you gripe and complain if your electricity flashes a little bit and goes out. You gripe and complain if the church ain't cool like it ought to be or heated like it ought to be. We're pitiful, aren't we? We're pitiful. We don't know nothing. And then we rear back in our unthankfulness and our wickedness. And we would have the audacity to say, God, you're not fair. What you did was wrong. In our deceived mind, we would think that. But you've got to be careful. <laughs> when you read the book of Job, man, you're not going to come out of the book of Job saying, I don't, I completely agree with you, God, man, pour it on them. You're going to come out of the book of Job scratching your head some and saying, wow. So Satan went forth in the presence of the Lord. And here we go, verse number, number 13. The Bible says, and there was a day. And in this day, the Bible says, his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And I want you to notice what happens. Because all of Job's children are gathered together at Job's oldest son's house. And then in verse number 14... There came a messenger unto Job and said, The oxen were plowing, and the asses feeding beside them. And the Sabaeans fell upon them and took them away. Yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. So the first messenger delivers the news. He says the Sabaeans. Now the Sabaeans are descendants from Sheba. You see that in Genesis 25.3. Sheba is the grandson of Abraham and Keturah. But anyway, they come in and they kill all of Job's servants while they're working. But notice this. This is how this thing's fixing to go down. You have got to pay attention to this. This is, this is you, can't, you can't write a horror movie any worse than this, folks. While he was yet speaking, listen now, verse number 16. While this dude runs up to him and gives him this news, 
while he's speaking, another guy's coming in behind him to start on some more news. Verse number 17. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The Chaldeans made out three bands and fell upon the camels and have carried them away, yea, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. <laughs> That's crazy. While he was yet speaking. Um, well, let's back up to verse number 16. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, The fire of God is fallen from heaven and hath burned up the sheep in the service and consumed them, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. So what happens here in verse number 16, while he was yet speaking, the first guy wasn't even done giving, up the, giving the bad news to Job. The next guy comes in, and he says, The fire got the livestock and the remaining servants. And, he, and this, notice, notice what he calls it. He calls it the fire of God. Now, was that the fire of God? <laughs> yes and no. <laughs> the devil did it. But who allowed him to do it? See it? You got to understand that stuff. I know it's tough to deal with. Now let's go to verse number 17. I'm sorry I'd initially skipped verse 16. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The Chaldeans made out three bands and fell upon the camels and have carried them away. Yea, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Again, again, notice what's going on while the fellow is giving the bad news. Another fellow comes right up on the scene, right in line to give some more. He says, the Chaldeans, which are from Babylon, they've come in. They made three bands. They come in and they stole Job's camels and killed the servants who were overseeing them. And then verse number 18. It's the same thing, but now he's going to get the worst news of all. While it was yet... Speaking, there came also another and said, Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house. And it fell upon the young men, and they are dead. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. A great wind comes up. Blows the house in on all of Job's children, and he loses them all at the same time. Now, you listen to me, and you listen to me carefully. If I was standing there, and I just went through what that man went through, in a matter of minutes, minutes, he's lost everything, and he's lost every one of his children. I would be out of my mind. You could, I wouldn't know where I was at. I'd collapse under it all. And remember, here's a man that's not born again like you and I. He doesn't have the permanent indwelling of the Holy Spirit. He doesn't have the Bible. He doesn't have the Scripture. And he, all at once, don't some of you now feel pretty good about your life? There was a day. All at once it comes on them. But now I want you to notice uh, Job's consecration. How does Job respond to this? <laughs> Verse number 20. Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head <laughs> and fell down upon the ground and worshiped. Can anybody in here tonight say, I'm not like Job? The Bible says he arose. He was at least sitting down when he got all the bad news, or either he had collapsed during the painful episode. The Bible says he rent his mantle. Now, a mantle was like a cape. Worn to, it was worn to cover your head and protect you from the wind and the cold. And then he shaved his head. And these acts were symbolic of sorrow and grief. You read about that just a couple of places. Esther 4.1, talking about Mordecai. When Mordecai perceived all that was done, Mordecai, the Bible says, rent his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes to irritate himself and put ashes on his head. 
And he went out in the midst of the city and cried with a loud and a bitter cry. Another reference, Micah 1.16. When they're under the judgment of God, notice what they're told to do. Make thee bald, pull thee with thy delicate children, enlarge thy baldness as an eagle, for they are gone into captivity from thee. He's saying, shave your hair, head, cut it all off, to r rent your clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes. They would put ashes on top of their head. You know what all that was? That is a sign of deep, deep, dark grief. But that's not all that he does. The Bible says that he falls down upon the ground after he rents his mantle and after he shaves his head. I understand that part, but the second part is the part I have trouble with. What does the Bible say that he does, church? He worships. And this is what he says during his worship. And said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Wow. He collapses back on the ground and he worships the Lord. And he says, Lord, I came here with nothing. And one day I'm going to leave this world with nothing. Lord, you gave me everything that I have. And now for some reason you've chosen to take everything away. Blessed be your name. Did the Lord take it away? <laughs> Again, yes and no. You better understand something. Many times the Lord is using the devil to get something done. Or he's allowing the devil to get something done. And the reason I keep emphasizing this is that when you and I have these times in our life where this terrible stuff shows up, if you believe that you're a child of God and he loves you unconditionally, unconditionally, and nothing can happen to you unless he allows it and he wants the best for you, do you believe that? then that means when the Lord allows access of the devil, access to your life, there's some greater purpose going on in heaven that you and I don't see, but we're just going to have to trust him in it. Do you understand that? We're just going to have to trust him in it. And then in verse number 22, In all this, Job sinned not, nor charge God foolishly. That's unbelievable, isn't it? Job did not sin. He did not blame God. The Bible says in that verse he did not sin in action. And he, he did not sin in speech. He did not sin by anything he did or anything that he said. I like what Dr. Ruttman quotes about this. Dr. Ruttman says, If the book of Job had ended here, no one would have ever found the bitter root which lay in Job's bosom that self-righteous ego that resides in all of us. And as we get on over in the Bible, this thing is going to be made more clear as to some of what was going on. But you're not going to hear, ever hear me give Job a hard time. He's better than any of us. And we have Christ living within us. However, God was not wrong because there was something that needed to be dealt with in Job's life. Even the best Christian in here has another level to go to. Amen? We never stop growing. We never stop learning. We should never stop repenting. We should all be, always be going ahead. And folks, we never know when... That day is coming for us. And what that day may mean for us. I want to end with a story. It just so happened this morning that I was able to catch um, some of Dr. Peacock's Sunday school. And he told a story. I've heard, I've heard other preachers tell this story a couple of times, but he told it again. And it just... I don't believe it was by accident. It come back to my memory, and I thought, yes, I do remember that. But the story goes like this about a man named Dr. Harold Seitler. Any of you ever heard of Dr. Harold Seitler? Uh, Dr. Harold Seitler was a great preacher. 
and he was the pastor of Tabernacle Baptist Church in Greenville, South Carolina for 43 years. At one time, Tabernacle Baptist Church, I believe, was the largest church in the state of South Carolina, and it wasn't large because of compromise. It was a good, right church. It just God had his hand on the thing, and he blessed it. Now, Dr. Harold Seitler was born in 1914, and he died in 1995. But years ago, I think it was in 1951, Dr. Harold Seitler was away preaching a, re a revival, and his wife and daughter were driving down the road, and a drunk driver went across the line and hit their car. His 11-year-old daughter was thrown out of the vehicle, and she died from, his, from her injury. His wife, as a result, had a mental breakdown and was admitted, admitted to a sanatorium. Now, the Sunday after all this happened, Dr. Seitler was sitting alone in his home in the pastorium, and the church was over there packed, and they were waiting for him to arrive. And the story goes that an old preacher friend came by that morning named Harv Stanberg, and he knocked on that screen door, and Dr. Seitler just sat there in the chair all by himself, and he came through that door and come in the house and he just stood there and looked at Dr. Seidler. And after a while, he turned around and without saying anything, he walked out. And Dr. Harold Seidler jumped up and said, well, wait, brother, why did you come here this morning? And <laughs> Harv Stanberg said, I just wanted to come see someone that the Lord wasn't afraid to turn the devil loose on. And he walked out and left. And Dr. Seitler got up and walked over to the church and he preached that Sunday morning on some things I've learned. Amen. I wonder if the Lord could trust any of us to turn the devil loose on us. I'm sure we're not going to ask him to, but here's the thing. Job didn't ask him to. God help us when that day comes and be able to say, you give, Lord, and you take. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And not charge God foolishly. Not sin, but be faithful. Could any Christian ever come over to us and say, I, I just wanted to come look at a man or a woman that God could trust to turn the devil loose on them. And that man or woman would remain faithful. Every head bow and eye closed.